So I'm going to be talking about not just my effort, but we have a, a team of great individuals who have been working on porting a large scale solar physics code to open ACC uh, for the past few years now. So all the names up here are um, people who have contributed in various different ways to this project. I also want to linger a moment on um, an acknowledgement slide, just acknowledging all the different resources that have given us their time and their support for our effort as well. This paper or this work has also been published recently in the recent PASS conference. Um, at the end, I'll show the, the ACM DOI and as well as my contact info for any questions uh, or any bigger questions after the talk. So the outline of the talk is that I'm first going to describe what MIRIM is, like what kind of science is it actually doing, uh, and then talk about the different challenges that we actually have encountered so far, focusing mostly on the things that might be a little more open ACC specific or things that might be open questions that I don't really have a good answer to how to solve them. And then finishing off with results of what our current benchmarks are and what kind of machines we're currently running on with open ACC. First off, the description of MIRAM. So MIRAM stands for the Max Planck University of Chicago Radiative MHD. So this is a solar physics simulation code. Um, so actually on the right side, I have a, uh, a movie where the top two images, so the, the orange and the gray image, just kind of looking at the sun, kind of like from the surface down, like if you, this is what you observe with a solar telescope, for example. So these are things that we can observe. Whereas the bottom two, um, so the two below those are kind of like a vertical cut of the sun's atmosphere. These are things that are like happening underneath the surface that we can't observe directly. And we have to simulate them to be able to understand how, how it actually works. Um, some of the goals that we have for MIRAM. So some of the short term, the short term goals is that there is going to be a uh, leap in the resolution of these solar observations. So there's actually a telescope that when I gave this talk at PASC, the telescope was accepting applications uh, for people to start actually using it. Um, so that's it's been a, you know, a month or two now, so I'm not sure exactly what stage, but it's a telescope that is near end production uh, in Hawaii. Um, and basically the, uh, the resolution of the observations is gonna be able to give of the sun are gonna be significantly larger. Um, and currently MIRAM running on the, uh, or I guess before this project, MIRAM running on solely CPUs was hitting a scaling limit. So we're getting a larger uh, resolution observation. We can't really throw more CPU cores at it that just won't give us the performance we need to match uh, to be able to do like meaningful science with this new data. So we started to look into moving MIRAM to GPUs to hopefully uh, bridge that gap. More of a long-term goal is um, that MIRAM currently runs quite a bit slower than real time. So if we wanna do to do things like uh, uh, predictions, like for example, the image on the right is showing a solar flare. So an ejection from the surface of the sun. If we want to be able to actually like predict those kind of solar events, the code would have to run faster than real time. Um, the, this GPU port alone is not going to probably not going to be enough to bridge that gap. Um, we'll be looking at things like ensembles and things like that, but this is an important portion of bridging that gap. That's why we want to move to the GPUs. Uh, so the reason we're using OpenACC specifically, um, like I said, we have a team of a bunch of different individuals coming from different uh, areas of expertise. And in our team, we have quite a handful of people with uh, very good open ACC experience or have worked on other large open ACC projects. So on the bottom right, actually, is uh, an application called MPASS. This is a sol or this is a weather modeling code and it's actually used in real world weather prediction currently. And this is a, it's a Fortran code that's running with open ACC. So some people from our team have actually worked directly with this code. So they're bringing that expertise to MIRAM. Um, also, we have some MIRAM users who are going to, so MIRAM has a handful of different use cases. It kind of depends on what your science goals are, but there are some users who are going to continue to run the code solely in its CPU version, possibly doing maybe smaller simulations, for example. So there will be people who will be using it on CPUs exclusively and people using it on GPUs. So we need to be able to support both of those while also supporting future physics or future code developments being added. And lastly, this is a pretty large code. Um, so being able to 
to port little pieces of it at a time to GPU, you know, get something running on the GPU, test it over and over to make sure the accuracy is what we expect before moving on to the rest of the code. That's been really helpful in our production flow because rewriting an entire code has a lot of uh, problems that we have been able to mostly avoid. <clears throat> so some of the challenges that we've encountered with NIR, I'm actually going to talk about two big ones that I think um, are either very specific to OpenACC or maybe just GPU programming in general um, that are that we either have uh, an open question to of like, well, we're not 100% sure what the solution is or things that we have ideas that we're actually testing. Um, so first off, uh, one of the big things in MIRAM is that it's doing a three-dimensional radiation transport. Um, and a lot, so in a lot of solar codes, they'll either, so in some solar codes, they won't do radiation transport at all. And some they'll do 2D, we're doing a three-dimensional, which is very uh, computationally intensive. Um, so much so that some people using Mira might just not use it at all if they don't specifically need the results of the radiation portion. So, um, however, the radiation transport is pretty important for uh, for a wide variety of science, and it also is the most time-consuming portion of the code by a pretty large margin. Um, especially if you wanted to do so, you can fine-tune the radiation transport to be more or less complex depending on. You know, you don't want it so complex that your code will never finish running, for example, but you want it complex enough to, to do the science that you're doing. Um, so radiation is pretty important from here, is what I'm getting at. And within radiation, uh, one function stands out above the rest as being a problem. And it's a uh, function called integrate. Um, so what essentially we're doing with the integration step of our radiation solver is we're uh, kind of moving across our three-dimensional space. Um, so we have eight occupants of our three-dimensional space and we'll be moving across at a specific angle, right? So for eight octants and each of them, we're gonna be moving in three different angles. So you're kind of sweeping across in 24 different patterns where we call them rays typically. So we have 24 different rays that we have to compute sweeping across a three-dimensional space. Um, however, when you're in typically in radiation transport codes, um, this kind of like sweeping across introduces a data dependency, which I'm going to kind of highlight with this cube in a moment. Okay, so, so basically we have to do 24 rays, all computing the integration. You have to compute the integration until a convergence is reached among all the different uh, processes. So typically in like the typical case scenario, you're probably running integrate 100 plus times per time step. And if you are uh, doing extra like complicated radiation for your code, that could be several hundreds of uh, integrations per time step. So the data dependency, um, it follows a wavefront data dependency pattern. We can kind of simplify it a bit in MIRAM. So for example, so the cube is, um, so each like chunk or each little cube in this Rubik's cube looking thing uh, could be like a grid space um, in, our, in our data set. Um, first, we start with the gray grid spaces. These are our boundaries. These are actually preloaded before um, the integration starts. They could be from it's like from the neighboring processes, or they can be computed through other parts of the code. But they're preloaded, and they'll never change for the entire integration uh, function call. Um, so then we can start computing from those. So all the points in red they can be computed in parallel because the only grid points that they depend on are the gray boundary conditions. So the things that are already preloaded. So the red can be computed in parallel right from the start. They don't have to wait for anything other than those boundaries to be loaded in. Then after you finish computing all of the red grid points, you can move to the next slice and compute the blue. So each of the blue grid points will depend on some of the red, maybe some of the boundaries, et cetera. So we're kind of moving through where you have to load the boundaries first, compute all the red, then compute all the blue. And then lastly, after the blue is done, you can compute the green, but you have to follow that kind of sequential ordering. Um, and this is the way that we simplified it. It's like I said, it's technically moving at kind of like a weird angle. So the data dependency could be kind of like a, like a, like a diagonal slice across the cube if you wanted. Um, but this is a much more simplified version and it's probably more efficient to do it like this because just how the code is written allows us to do it like this. Um, but having to obey this data dependency brings up a few problems. 
Um, so first off, each of those two dimensional slices, though we can compute them in parallel, they're very small. They're only about a few 10,000 grid points um, per slice, which is far off of what GPUs typically want to compute. Um, so when we're, when we're doing those as GPU kernels, those kernels are very small, they're very inefficient. Um, and we're doing them in a sequential order and we're doing like you know a few, a few hundred of them per call to integrate. So if you actually look at the uh, this NVProf screenshot, what we're kind of result what we're kind of ending up with is all of these blue boxes are the little two dimensional slices being computed on the GPU, and they're being launched in a sequential ordering those kind of slices. And there's a bunch of time spent in between those where you actually have to do things like launch the kernel to the GPU. Um, we actually our first attempt at like parallelizing this specific code this overhead of like the gap between them was like probably about 10 times worse because there was other open ACC runtime stuff happening in between each call. And we actually ended up having to do things like saving all of our data directly as GPU pointers um, to stop, the, stop the runtime from adding in extra overhead. And even then we're still in a situation where we are having a lot of, uh, I guess, idle time, just waiting for the kernels to be launched. Um, so this is one of our main problems. We have a few solutions that we're trying for this. Um, a few of our friends at NVIDIA have recommended things like CUDA graphs seem to be pretty promising. Um, we're hesitant to go that route of adding like CUDA to the code just for this one function. We're looking at other ways to kind of refactor the code and maybe switch around the algorithm a little bit to act to allow for more parallelism. So one thing that if anyone has like an idea or if the OpenAC uh, community has a feature, for example, with something like a CUDA graph to launch a bunch of kernels ahead of time um, or something like that, that might actually be really important for, for the specific problem. If there isn't another uh, possible workaround. The other problem that we're running into is this is the second two of two. Um, is we're looking at uh, the GPU occupancy of a few different kernels that we're running. So the fourth column here, the RTS integrate, that is the function I've been talking about for the past few slides. And I just have a few other random ones. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail exactly like what each of them do or anything, but one of the common problems that we're seeing, right? So for RTS integrate, we're seeing that because we're only parallelizing two dimensions of our problem, our occupancy is low. That's something that we expect. We're not giving the GPU enough data to work with, right? We know why this is happening. But for things like MHD, TBD, and cons here, we're running into a problem where even theoretically, even though we're giving it the, the GPU a bunch of data or full data set, um, the occupancy is still really low. Um, and we're seeing that this is because the number of GPU registers that are being allocated for these kernels is pretty high, which is um, something that's hard to really, I guess, put a reason to, because these kernels specifically are pretty large. I say they're like a few hundred lines of code, typically each within a loop. So there's a lot going on. So we compile them. It's like, it's using a lot of registers. So the, so the, the occupancy is this number and it's like, okay, well, we have a few hundred lines of code. We don't really know what we can change about it directly to affect, to be able to affect these numbers. So another thing that we would be open to feedback on from, uh, we'd be open to feedback on is ways to fine tune uh, these kind of like resource allocation things, right? Working with the C++ code. So how do the changes to the code really affect these numbers so that we can hopefully improve this? Because these are also pretty important kernels to the code. Um, and last thing I want to talk about is just results to kind of show where the code is at and like what kind of machines it's running on currently. So the results that we presented at PASC and the results that I'm gonna show were um, run on the Cobra supercomputer that is housed at the Max Planck Computing and Data Facility. Um, so we have, we have up to 64 GPU nodes. So each of those nodes are running two uh, V100 NVIDIA GPUs. And then for our compilers, for all the CPU results, it's the Intel 19 compiler which add all the CPU compilers as well, or all the C, um, of all the different CPU compilers, like between like, you know, GCC and, and things like that. We found that Intel for Miriam has been the fastest for CPU. Um, and then for GPU compilers, we're using uh, NVHPC 20.9 with CUDA 11. 
Uh, and one thing to note that I'm going to point out later as well is that both of these runs, so both CPU and GPU, um, is running a CPU-based FFTW library. So even for the GPU runs, we're still doing an FFT, and that's still running on the CPU. That's things we're actually working on right now to move that to a GPU-enabled library. But I'm going to point that out in, in the results. So some strong scaling. So this is keeping a uh, 288 cubed data set and keeping that data set constant while increasing the number of GPUs from one GPU to eight GPUs. Um, and we're also looking at a different number of bands. I didn't really go into exactly what bands are, but essentially they are increasing the uh, amount of computation that has to happen in the radiation solver, right? So four band means that the radiation takes roughly four times as much work as one band, and I can go all the way up to 12. So that'd be 12 times as much work to be done over uh, one band. And which band you choose would kind of depend on what your physics and what your science goals are. Um, overall, so the y-axis of the plot is essentially throughput, more or less. So the higher the number, the better, the higher the throughput. The x-axis is the number of GPUs. And a perfect scaling would be a perfectly linear line. So if we double the number of GPUs, we'd want the throughput to double. However, because we're reducing the amount of data points per GPU, um, those numbers tend to not scale perfectly. Typically, we want to max out the GPU as much as we can. So when we start to reduce data per GPU, we start to lose efficiency. And that could be seen a little better in this next one. Where we're actually going from a larger data set but we're doing starting with four GPUs and going all the way up to 100 GPUs. No, actually this is 96, so not quite 100, four to 96 GPUs. And um, we can kind of see that uh, specifically for the radiation transport, RT, this red line, is that it scales pretty poorly the higher the GPU count because, um, or at least we think because RT already has problems having enough data to really fill out the GPU. So when you increase that, decrease that data like to be even smaller, it just does worse and worse. Because um, you can see that RT scales pretty poorly. Um, and if you were to take out RT from the total runtime, the total, uh, the green bar would scale quite a bit better. And last result is our weak scaling, which is one that we typically care about a little bit more. Um, so on the y-axis, we have the time taken in seconds per time step. Um, a perfect scaling would be a perfectly flat line um, and we're scaling from between one to 100 GPUs. So in this, every time we add a new GPU, we're also adding another 288 cubed piece of data to the data set. So the number of grid points per GPU stays consistent. And what we can kind of see from this is that RT has a little bit of trouble. It's mostly flat. Um, R so RT stands out a little bit, but still mostly okay. Um, the rest of the code is pretty good. Um, our CPU FFT is kind of terrible, but like I said, it's a CPU FFT library running with the GPU code. That's something that we're fixing. Um, but overall, we're start we're overall happy with the weak scaling um, that we're achieving with OpenACC. And this is just a summary slide of uh, summarizing where we are on the project. So right now, a single NVIDIA, a single V100 GPU is about 1.7 times faster than a dual socket CPU node. That's kind of what we've been comparing it to. Um, we still have a single single source code for CPU and GPU and our, the ability to use multiband radiation is like, we're, we're starting to bridge that gap to the point that it might be realistic to use it in future science. And then I have some future work. Uh, like I said, I have the ACM past 2021 DOE. If you wanted to read the full paper, where I talk about much more about what the science is doing and much more about very minor, the larger and smaller optimizations that we did. And if you have any like longer questions, um, you can get in touch with me at my email and I'll probably forward it to the group so we can answer it more efficiently. Mm -hmm.